Congratulations, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a new year and a um, further season three of Unsung. I really appreciate you all joining me. And today I have a guy in the studio that although I've known the name of for quite a while, I actually haven't sat down with the guy to get to know him. As a matter of fact, today is the first day we meet. So this is going to be an interesting podcast for me and I'm sure for you too. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Marvin Key. Marvin, how the hell are you doing? I'm great. Right on, man. Uh, first of all, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, uh, glad to be here. Yeah, and the fact that you and I hadn't met and that you trust me enough to sit in front of a camera and... and uh, yeah, I wasn't sure what we were going to talk about, but let's do this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about some great shit, absolutely. Um, so let me ask you, you know, what is kind of a primary question of this show, and that is... Who is Marvin Key? Where does Marvin come from? Where did you originate? Born in Calgary? Born in Canada? Um, like my larval state? Yes. Um, I was born in Los Angeles. And uh, I'm East Indian Filipino. Uh, lived around the world um, as a youngster, as a youngin, and uh, ended up in Calgary. Interesting. Which is now considered my beautiful Groundhog Day. Right. Uh, and we'll get into, you said Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, but to start, oh, so I didn't know you were born in L.A. Uh, and then you said you moved around, so obviously your yeah, parents. my father was an engineer, so. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so where did you guys move to? Like, did you go over to Europe, anything like that, or? I uh, lived in the Philippines for three years, lived in London for a couple years, um, England, that is, um, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, ended up moving back to Calgary, and uh, I tried to get out of here, moved to Vancouver, came back to Calgary, moved to Victoria, came back to Calgary, moved to Montreal, came back to Calgary, and some sort of sense of inertia keeps bringing me back to Calgary, and I used to hate it here, but now I love the shit out of it. Do you really? Oh, yeah. So let me ask you a question, because that begs, I think, a couple questions. Number one, what did you not like about it to begin with? <clears throat> the mundane, uh, the boredom, um, the lack of entertainment. Uh, I don't know, country music, but now I love it. Would uh, would the music. antiseptic nature of it be anything? What's that? The antiseptic nature of it, the sort of, um, you know, the, I mean, it's a great place to raise a family, but, you mm -hmm. know, in a sense, where's the culture well, in the place? Yeah, well, I'm here now. I reside here now uh, permanently for a while. I've been here for the last while because I have a son here, mm. um, Quincy, and um, he lives here, and you know, I kind of prefer that he lives in Calgary because this is a great city for a child to grow up in. Right. And how old's Quincy? He's 11 now. 11. Yeah. Cool. Hey, Quincy, in case you're watching. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's awesome. So what is it about Calgary now that you dig? What changed your mind or, or how did your mind change? Um, well, I grew up here for a long time and... Uh, I just got to know the scene, the, the music scene here in Calgary, and got to know a lot of the people, like I've uh, dumped in many genres of music of this city and um, embodied all of them, all the genres. And uh, it's just got a thriving music scene and a, an amazing community of people here. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I've said it on the show and you know, of course, I, I can't help but reiterate it, and that is that I think 
Calgary in its own right is could be uh, Boston, you know, uh, in terms of well, education. I, I, I tell people that all the time. I'm, I mean, um, this could be the next uh, Seattle. This could be the next Minneapolis, right? We don't know that, but from being here and what I've seen and heard, I honestly believe that this could be a hub of some beautiful magic, magic, magical sounds. Absolutely. And yeah. culture, man. I mean, uh, we talked about Wakefield Brewster off the off camera. Yeah. And, you know, when I saw that guy, I mean, what a motherfucker. Oh, yeah. He's very talented. Yeah. yeah. Quite the wordsmith for sure. Oh, and he's got so much to say. Yes. Uh, and so much good shit to say. So much, you know, depth mm -hmm. uh, of writing in his stuff. Yeah. And once again, you know, that to me is culture. Yeah. Uh, you know, not that cowboy boots aren't either. But yeah. this is a depth of culture that talks about, you know, maybe why a truck would be built instead of why it's driven. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, you know, I found him a very interesting cat in that respect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And there's many others like him in the city, you know. You just got to find, and they're not even hidden gems anymore. Like, they're gems and they're going to shine. Right, yeah. right. And you say, you know, you say that, uh, you know, we don't know for sure if this city could be... Uh, whatever, right? A St. Louis, a Cincinnati, a no, I don't Philadelphia. Even, I don't even think about that, if it's going to be or not. I just think we all just keep working on what we do, and eventually they'll come to us. And I think that along with, you know, uh, believing what you just said, you know, it's we might as well fucking try. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, not to be something different than what we are, yeah. but try to be exactly what we are, and pull out, extract mm -hmm. that that necessary, uh, I hate to say talent, but ability mm -hmm. uh, and mastery of this city. Yeah. You know, when I yeah. interview like Pat Bellavo and guys like that, mm -hmm. I mean, the staples of this town, yeah. uh, the guys that play their asses off, we have it here. We so have it here. Mm -hmm. So you, what was it about music? I'm interested. What was it about music that kind of grabbed you and, and got a hold of you? Well, uh, mine started at early age. I, uh, I don't like authority figures, you know, like I never got along with uh, principals. I always got kicked out of schools and stuff. And for me growing up as a kid, it was like, I know it sounds cliche, but it was like sticking it to the man. <laughs> and I was still doing it. Let I me ask you. I haven't stopped. <laughs> yeah, let me ask you a question about that. Because uh, that's intriguing to me, you know, I mean, that used to be the, the phrase, right? You know, stick it to the man, right? Yeah, like more than anything, these days, you need rock and roll. <laughs> well, absolutely, and, but... And I'm not hearing it as much, but, you know, well, got to keep moving it. And you and I were talking about this, once again, off camera, you know, mm -hmm. about the fact that sticking it to the man is one thing, but sticking it to the man may just be another way to say skepticism, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Yeah. And so, you yeah, know, I that stick it, that. yeah, the stick it to the man kind of seems like a judgment, an unnecessary judgment on the person who is otherwise just being skeptical, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and so I find that, you know, very interesting. And I was very much like that too, dude, mm -hmm. growing up. I mean, I still am. I, I haven't changed. One of the reasons this show exists is because I believe in skepticism. Yeah. I believe in asking questions, absolutely. And that doesn't mean judgment. As a matter of fact, skepticism gets you away from judgment, whereas cynicism brings you closer to it. Yeah. Right? Nihilism brings you closer to hate yeah. than a healthy... Oh, there was a lot of hate for sure. You know, there was a lot of judgment yeah. and nihilism on my end growing up. Yeah. Growing up, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm quite optimistic these days, you know, especially being a father, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, I find, you know, the kids these days, if I can say it that way, mm -hmm. far more intuitive and educated or knowledgeable, let's say, oh, yeah. you know, than I was. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I told uh, uh, Sal when he was on the show, you know, yeah. like all I cared about at, you know, his age was chicks and rock and roll, you mm -hmm. know, and here he's espousing, you know, philosophy to me. Yeah, at that age, and so I find that hopeful, like you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so, but that skepticism must have informed you somehow on the way you view the world, on how you see the world. Well, um, 
when it got into music, it was rock and roll and like punk music, like The Clash, like at an early age. Um, but it also opened doors to music, like as a whole, like I got into jazz at a very early age. Like uh, there was something about smoky bars and sax and piano in a dark room with a bunch of cool cats that really grabbed my eye that, you know, like... Uh, Are you talking about... That like lured me into... Back to Coltrane the, and yeah, Davis. Like, yeah, and then I got into jazz fusion. Um, like who? Who specifically? Like Chick? Like jazz fusion? Yeah, oh, like, like Chick. God, back in the 80s, I used to go, like, just as a kid, I'd go see Chick Corea, uh, Joe Zauno from Weather Report, right. uh, John Schofield... Uh, sure. Yeah, but I mean, but that wouldn't happen if I didn't, because I, I grew up, I'm, I'm old, man, like, I, I grew up, like, my first gig was the King Eddie, like, I right. was, like, snuck in, I was, like, 16, with my guitar, and with the walk pedal, and trying to feel like a Hendrix, you know, and... And we're not talking about the King Eddie of the last four years. We're talking about no, the King Eddie. No, we're talking Eddie. about the King Eddie in the late 80s. <laughs> the King Eddie, yeah. Eddie. yeah, you know, yeah. I go there for the wings and for the fry special or, you know, mm. the ladies in the back room. And uh, But I would also get into, like, the blues players that had passed through the King Eddie at the time. I mean, when you're a kid and you're, like, helping Jeff Healy into a taxi, it changes your life. Right, like, hmm. like uh, who else? I see Otis Rush, uh, Buckwheat, Zydeco. You know, and, and you know it opens your doors, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, rock and roll, blues, and then it leads into jazz. You know, and then then you get jazz, and then it gets into hip hop, and and then it was like funk, and that's what I do now is, I I I'm a I'm a funk guy. I'm a R and B funk dude. But I grew up playing in a lot of metal bands. <laughs> right. Okay. Like behind the curtain, I was uh, I got into I was listening to Soul. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right out in the world with my friends, I was like playing metal and rock. So it just lead led to many different genres um, stemming from musicals. Right. From musicals. Yeah. I like started from musicals. And, yeah. And I'm like you get into you know, it just starts weaving in. It all weaves together, man. Yeah. You know? Well, going back to what you said, you know, <clears throat> there is some great inspiration in that proximity to the people you respect. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about letting Jeff Healy, you know, uh, helping him into a taxi. Yeah. You know, there is something about that energy, isn't there, that that makes you realize... I just, you wanted, so I just wanted something that was not my father. I wanted something that wasn't my principal of my school, huh. you know, like, I just wanted, I, I needed, uh, what do we call that, like, icon, icons, or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I elders, hold, elders I hold, that would influence me in right. a way, like, you you got one life, man, like, is this it, just, like, this is it, like, or can we, oh, look, there's this dude over there, he's pretty cool, man, he's playing that sax, hmm. who is that guy, right? <laughs> Let me ask you this. Did you he's find... He's not holding a gun. He's holding the sax. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Was it... <clears throat> was there an acceptance for you then? Like, you and I probably... And, I, you know, I'm assuming a few things, but through you saying what you're saying, mm -hmm. it seems to me like you and I may hold a similar childhood in some senses. So, uh, and that of non-acceptance, meaning that you want to do what? Fuck you. Yeah. You know, get a job, be a man. Yeah, well, what, I did whatever. everything they told me to do. I was a total jock. I was on every team at school. I was on long distance running. I was on basketball, soccer, I, straight A's. So you I tried did, pretty I fucking did all hard. Of that. Right. And it was like, so what's next? Like, you're going to sculpt me to be an engineer, like my dad was, you know? Uh. Uh, what, what, like a priest? Like, you know, I grew up in in the Catholic church and went to like church camps, you know, right. and it's, this is what you get from church camps. <laughs> yeah. I grew up with Jimmy Swagger. So as a matter of fact, I played for Jimmy back in the day, but uh, yeah. 
yeah nothing wrong with church i love church but yeah. you know like geez the rules like what come on you know like i'd rather hear chet baker i'm gonna hang with chet baker i'm right. not hang with a priest right <laughs> well i would say they both have their value now for me i mean i started pulling out pots and pans at six months old yeah. so there was something intrinsic there i think mm -hmm. that was necessary uh yeah. for me uh, but, you know, also when I got into my teens and everything was Rush or, you know, Fleetwood Mac or whatever, yeah. you know, it was also about that mystery. It was also about the stage and what that meant and the whole subculture of that or culture of that, really, in that sense. Yeah. So I'm you know, fascinated with subcultures myself. And, you know, I'm not seeing too many subcultures um, emerge uh, lately probably in the past 15 years, I haven't seen much, you know, like I'm a kid that grew up in London. Mm. So when I was like eight years old, you know, uh, walking around and just seeing, you know, punk rock for real, you know, with safety <laughs> pins in their, through their nostrils and ripped, right. like you, you question that, like what, how did that evolve? Right. Why are they like this, you know? Uh, well, go ahead and answer. Do you think you have an, like an answer for that? Because that intrigues me. Why? See, I spent some time in London myself. I, I, I believe in the underdog. I believe I believe in punk rock. I believe in saying fuck you, you know? Right. I, I, well, because of my shitty upbringing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And it seems to me and like... And I'm glad I chose that path. Like, I love it. My yeah. Life. And... But I'm seeing subcultures die, and it's sad. I'm seeing, like, you know, people don't like dick hippies anymore. People don't like, I don't, you know, I was, grew up in the industrial scene. I don't see much industrial happening. Yes, it's there. Yeah. Um, really underground, but I don't, you know, I don't really see much emerging. Especially, like you said, in, in way of industry. Yeah. Right. You know, well, I feel like, what's the new jazz? Well, hey, kids, where's the jazz at? What, where? Where you where where are you going? Well, in are any you industry, staring at screens at home, or where are you checking out some jazz? You know, like, yeah. Where's the next Miles Davis? In any Jimmy industry, Hendrix? yeah. In any industry, yeah. You know, I, I forget the the book, and it was a book that was written quite a while ago. But it said, you know, one of the lines in the book was, you know, Joe, it used to be where we made shit, mm -hmm. you know, and now all we do is suck the corporate teat, necessarily, yeah. Yeah. and uh, and. I don't see that much difference between any sort of, you know, industry like that and the music industry really in a lot of senses. Like you said, where is culture gone? What is the new culture? Yeah. It would seem to me like a guy like you is looking for that. Or we'll just make it ourselves. Sure. Yeah. We'll sure. Create ourselves. Yeah. Stop waiting around. Yeah. Right. I was going to drop out of music a long time ago, but then I was like, I'm not seeing anything around. Now's the perfect time to do it. I think. What did that spur you to do in that moment? Just be dad, get a job. I do web design, graphics. So go sit in the office and just stare at a screen and make websites for corporations. Right, but when you were about to give up on music. Yeah. That's and then you looked around. Right, but then you looked around and said, wait a minute. Everything is like going the direction that the man wants it to. Mm. <laughs> Well, let me so ask I you. I was like, all right, now's the perfect time. Let's go do this. Right. And let's so what go, did that... Let's go slay. Right. Yeah. Right. But you're back. What's that? You're back in a sense. Yeah. You're, you're back to creating. You're back. Oh, especially to... after what I've gone through the past couple of years with my health. Yeah, I'm back. Like, I, I, I get to live. Hmm. Yeah. I'm in remission. Right. I just found out a few weeks ago. So I'm going to slay from this day forward. So you're in remission. Yeah, I found yeah. it a couple of weeks ago. Well, congratulations, number yeah. one. Uh, number two, what, if you don't mind, and you can answer as much of this and not answer as much of it as you care to, yeah. but what did that experience do for you? I mean, I've had my own experiences, especially, you know, in the last 10 years. I mean, my life has changed quite a bit. Yeah. My ideology, ideologies have changed. The way I think has changed. Uh, and those through traumatic events. Yeah. 
Which uh, experience are we talking about? There's, like, there's a lot of traumatic events happening in my life. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, okay. And, and I'm Which sorry for that, but <laughs> I, I guess I'm talking about the whole remission. And, and, yes, and, the that, cancer, I, and the that, impact. Yes, I've been battling cancer for the past couple of years. I've got, I got throat cancer, and I ended up doing 33 radiations to the neck, which has been kind of difficult to speak during this interview, but it's been great. Mm. And uh, nine chemotherapies, and uh, it was in my throat, and then it spread to my lung, and then to the back of my eye, where I was wearing an eye patch. For like eight months playing shows with the thing on <laughs> jesus but you were yeah. still playing I, I played throughout the whole two years yeah and just pump the energy level like mach 10 i got five albums on the go uh i joined more bands you know my uh i joined eight number eight this week uh, a rockabilly, psychobilly band called Psychomanic. Okay. And, uh, right when I to was told I had cancer, uh, I was asked if I wanted to play bass in a punk rock band. I'm like, yes, please. And I didn't stay in bed. People wanted me to stay in bed. And I just raged against the machine and went out and played my ass off and recorded my ass off. Yeah. Right. That's pretty awesome. No rest for the wicked. I did collapse once, but uh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm still alive. Mm, mm, yeah. Right. And kicking, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. Kicking out the jams. Right. Mm -hmm. So in respect to that, um, well, there's one thing that I wanted to touch on, which was something I think uh, Scott Morin brought to my attention, mm -hmm. which was this play that you're involved in. Can you explain... That yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm part of this uh collective called Making Treaty Seven, and uh, I'm the bass player and chimes man. I bring the chimes magic, I'm the sound of magic in the play, okay. And it's indigenous stories that we've uh have been part of for six, seven years now. It feels like it's been a long time, and um, I'm Truly honored to be part of that. So this has been an on, an ongoing endeavor for yes. the last six. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's nothing like playing with indi indigenous drumming and uh, the vibration of the actors um, in the room. All you know, we all coalesce together and create this beautiful thing. Um, we we get together. We we smudge. We pray. Uh, it's the most enlightening, positive experience of my life. Probably the, and I keep saying this to them, that they're the best band I've ever been in. Really, huh? Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. By far. And so what, what is it, because you, you know, I, I said this as an aspect of, <coughs> as a, of a play. Mm -hmm. So is there dialogue in this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what is the there's basic? There's music, there's uh, singing uh, dialogue. It's potent with information uh, in regards to the indigenous culture, um, the good, uh, the bad, um, history, the future. It's all there in one package. Yeah. So an honest representation yes. of the culture itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, primarily indigenous people. Involved yeah, in the I have, project. I have a, a lady by the name of Michelle Thrush in my life that that um, got me into that on that path, and I have learned so much about the indigenous culture. I have, I'm still learning. Like I'm a student. Every time I'm in this band, um, I'm a student. And whenever I hear those drums pounding right next to me, yeah. and I just play the bass or chimes, it's uh, it's magic. It's pure magic. Yeah. It's better than being an engineer. <laughs> Any day of the week, right? Yeah. I uh, <clears throat> we need engineers. I'm just saying. Well, of course I we do. want to be one. I want to do something else. Right. Different. It's not about whether or not a person should be an engineer. It's about what their <clears throat> desire is. Yeah. And is any desire greater yeah, than we another? We need engineers. And without engineers, we wouldn't have structures. We'd be like, you know. Sure. Still living in huts. Or I, I'd live in a windmill. I don't know. Well, uh, you know, without, we need engineers for windmills. So, 
without philosophers, yeah. though, we never would have thought about whether or not we needed a windmill. Yeah. And that's what we do. Yeah, I like that. You see what yeah, I mean? I like that. Right. Yeah. That's what we do. <laughs> we think about the shit mm -hmm. that others will create. That's why music to me, art yeah. in particular, is so important and so valuable to the culture itself because it asks the questions that others will go on to answer. Yeah. It's like, you know, the, the uh, like Socrates mm -hmm. was arguably uh, the first philosopher which came before any other disciplines. Philosophy yeah. is the birthplace of all other disciplines. And I'm talking science, medicine, yeah. all of the disciplines. Why? Because you needed to ask yourself a question first before you could seek the answer to it. So to me, that's what is so intrinsically value about the artistic community. Yeah, I read that in a book. Uh, what was it called? That I have uh, Secret Power in Music. Great book. I think it's uh, based on Plato saying, um, as in life, so in music. Right? And right. Uh, I know what you're saying. Like, yeah, what you're saying, man. Well, Nietzsche himself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was was purported to say that art, uh, creation, mm -hmm. were the existence for man. That that was the yeah. reason that we existed, was to create, was to think yeah. about creation. Yeah. Let's think about how to create. That reminds me of the intro to 2001, A Space Odyssey, with the, uh, the mm. monkeys and the monolith. And the monolith, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who well, created that monolith? Well, that's just it, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that, that was the, the genius, I think, especially of that opening scene in the whole movie, really, in that sense, right? Was to ask ourselves the questions, where where does all this shit come from? Yeah, I think you were just saying that before the, this interview, that we should go back to 3000 BC or something. Is that what you were saying? Well, <laughs> you know, here's the thing, is that I, I know... Uh, if we did, I want to be the monolith in that scene. Uh, do you want to be the monolith there? <laughs> uh, I'll cast standing you. standing there all in black. <laughs> think about it no dude you might actually be onto something no i mean you know we talk about uh you know and, and i think that it's you know, we're maybe not saying it as much anymore but you now i want to go back to the 50s or i want to go back to the 40s or i want to go back to the wrong 20s or whatever right to me i feel like we need to go back to 3000 bc yeah. And the and reason I was saying I'd just go back to the 60s as a musician so I could do all that political shit as a musician and then dance it out, right. rock it out in the 70s, then dance it out the late and then start break dancing in the 80s at the age of 60. Right. And so you could kind of psychedelically <laughs> work out. I would have gone through all all the phases, all the phases as a musician. <laughs> Not I don't not saying music didn't exist before the Roaring Twenties. I'm just saying that that would, if, as a musician, it just seems like that would have been a good, nice little uh, path of, uh, for a musician to, to follow. It would just go from, you know, the late 60s to the rock and roll in the 70s and the disco in the 80s. And, you know. Well, I'm with you because, you know, I just miss Woodstock yeah, by I a mean, few years. Yeah, well, we just saw that. Uh, documentary uh what was it 99 mm. stock yeah that was a different story though wasn't so it? there you go right there right you yeah. want to go to that woodstock or would you go hang out with the hippies in the 60s right. i'd go for love yeah 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 well and, and in a sense that's kind of what creation, i'm talking about not hate and destruction you know right yeah. Whether it's back 30 years or 3,000 years, yeah. that's the ideology, I think. Now, there's nothing to say that 3,000 BC, we were fully loving on each other. Mm -hmm. I, I doubt in some respects we are. But philosophically, we were beginning the course of trying to figure ourselves out, mm -hmm. the reason for our existence, yeah. what maybe meant the most to us and how we were going to survive through the epochs of time in which we have. Mm -hmm. And when I bring up 3000 BC, you know, sometimes I'm met with with uh, a little bit of glibness. But yeah. think about it. We lived for at least 100,000 years as a species in some form, right? Yeah. From Neanderthal and, and Homo sapiens winning out to present Tad day. Tadpoles. Tadpoles all the way up, right? So what is <laughs> the, it that I say, right? What is it that I say in 150 years we could still be surviving and using nuclear fusion mm -hmm. energy as a way to to uh, to run our uh, planet and yeah. and our societies and the way forward? Uh, I don't think there's anything glib about. I, I feel that. like I'm more uh, 
I said moving back, I'm more of a futurist these days. I like to imagine what the future looks like and try to make it happen. Absolutely. Micho Kaku? Any ring a bell? No. no? Uh, uh, no. Micho is, uh, he's sort of the father of string theory. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Micho really, uh, and not string just String theory. String theory. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, Micho is, is, and he's not alone in this. I mean, mm -hmm. this is sort of the understanding among science and yeah. astrophysics and these sorts of things is that we will very likely in all that, not all that long from now, mm -hmm. or not that far from now, sorry, reach a type one civilization. So at the moment we're type zero, we get our energy from plants and fossils yeah. and moving into a type one, we will nuclear fusion will take over. Now, we just learned about three weeks ago that for the first time since nuclear fusion, they actually not only met net zero energy, mm -hmm. which means that they got the equivalent energy out on the other side that they put in on the other, on the one side. Yeah. They actually got 50% more energy mm -hmm. out than they put in. And yeah. that's never happened in terms of nuclear fusion. Yeah. It's always taken more energy and what comes out the other side is less energy than it takes to produce that energy. Yeah. So it's non-viable. Yeah. But now they're doing that. And Micho and astrophysicists and all these people believe that in the next uh, 150 years, nuclear fusion will be a, more than a potential. Mm -hmm. It will be the, the way we, uh, we get our energy from. Along with that also comes yeah. the philosophy that we as people will have worked out our shit enough to move into the next epoch yeah. of a civilization. Not that it's, it happens overnight or you walk through a door. Mm -hmm. It's not saying that, but that we will move to that end. That's amazing. Right. And so where does music fit in all this? Well, that's what I mean about going back to 3000 BC. Mm -hmm. If Socrates said it, and you said Plato said it, yeah. right? And we say that... Uh, that um, German philosophers have said it, mm -hmm. and music and art are not going anywhere, mm -hmm. except at the moment perhaps being corporatized, yeah. but they're not going anywhere. The spirit of man is intrinsic to art, or art is yes, intrinsic to the spirit of man. Yeah. So I don't believe that... Well, I mean, they say, um, if you want to know how society is doing, uh, listen to the music they're playing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah ask an artist. And I've been listening... <laughs> and, and 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 what's your report? I'm hearing I'm I'm hearing some decay, but like I said, I'm optimistic. I'm a, I'm an optimist. I, I believe things are just gonna. It's like a pendulum, you know. It's like it's gonna sway the other way into some beautiful, amazing, magical things. I think so too. It'll be like a factory, a Willy Wonka factory of music, right? Coming out soon. Right, except not corporatized and perhaps not oligarchically so. Um, and if it doesn't, then we're all going to die. Well, you know, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that that, that you know, of course, that may sound uh, somewhat, what, uh, glib, but it's it's also kind of true. And, you know, like, I don't mind when calling I say, it. When I, when I talk about music, I talk about all art, you know, it's not just music, it's uh, poetry. Of course. Um Paintings and all yeah, of those all, expressions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. From uh, Cornell West, yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. and, and and that sort of understanding, yeah. sociological understanding and and uh, historical understanding. Yeah, of you know himself, his yeah. people, uh, you know the way that he's able to help someone like myself understand what that means. Yeah, is just as invaluable as as uh, Lavilla Strangiano. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. and if and there might be an argument for more so, but like there is this sort of underlying beauty and decay as well. I mean, you know, like uh, uh, musically speaking, uh, like take for instance, uh, like punk rock. People think, oh, music's going to shit. Like, listen to that garbage. Look, listen to that noise. But that noise could be the most beautiful noise that's probably going to make a change in history, right? But we could view it as, or hear it as garbage. But to me, it's like, wow, this is like power. It's powerful, right? Same with rap in the early days. Rap was like really fun and happy. And then when it, when it got into uh, more into the public enemy, then I was like, wow, like, 
this is power, like this is powerful, right? Um, musicians don't necessarily have to be perfect because sometimes I, I find imperfection and perfection, like growing up as a, in a jazz connoisseur, um, I noticed that uh, it's lost its essence, you know? It's like, wow, we got to a point where we were just showing, we're showing off too much. Where's the soul, right? And so that's, that, it led me to, from jazz to punk rock with like three chords. And I really found uh, the space, the space uh, around it so liberating and powerful. There's power in just three notes compared to a hundred. Right. Yeah. You know, for me, it all really comes back so to it's perspective. the passion. Like it's perspective, yeah. right? You, we could say, oh, things are going really bad musically, but really it could be like, I've been to noise shows myself and just listened to a bunch of noise that was just so like therapeutic. But I've heard some noise that just made me feel ill. When you talk about punk, punk to me was necessary. Oh. And when you say public enemy, why weren't they called Disneyland? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. They were called public enemy for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that reason was because there was a problem. Yeah. Right? Punk initiated really out of the anger and the distrust uh, and the feeling of emptiness mm -hmm. of the British, I suppose, in, in most respects, yeah. and the way that they were being dealt with and handled. Yeah. So musicians are speaking, or at least were speaking, mm -hmm. to the issues of the day. Yeah. Like any poet would, yeah. or Cornel West would, you and I we're doing the same thing. The 60s were the same thing. Now, I'm not going backwards and saying, oh my God, I want to be in the 60s. No, that's not my point. My point is, what are we doing today? I don't know. I have a feeling uh, in the future, uh, punk is going to be like soul music. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, you know, right? Is it, right? It's going to be soul music. Right. And there yeah. again, you know, soul music was... Soft core. Soft core. <laughs> Why do you think something heavy is coming? <laughs> you know, we start hugging each other and treating each other nicely. Like, man, that's so punk rock to hug people. Right, right. right? Hey, I long for the day. And stranger <laughs> things have happened. Um, well, and I believe that we have to go that direction. Yeah. In order to continue this human experiment, mm -hmm. I feel like we have to move forward yeah, with a benevolence. Look at this uh, little sculpture here. It just says love. And I'm like, wow, right. nice little sculpture for the interview. Love. All psychedelic, too. Isn't it? Yeah. And, and yeah, I've, I've actually never drawn my attention to that mm -hmm. side that's of great. my own place. Yeah, it garnishes uh, the interview, for sure. Well, it really does. And, dude, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Here's the thing. I mean, you and I have, you know, here's another just interesting observation for me, anyway. You and I have never met. Up until today, no. we never met. We've yeah, seen each other on like Facebook. My brother. Well, and I feel really <laughs> like, isn't this amazing what dialogue like, does? Yeah, for sure. It's like my dinner with Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> right, without the food. Uh, that was last episode with my kid. I got you know, some sushi on the way. Oh, nice. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> no, but isn't that strange that just mm -hmm. through dialogue and just two people sitting together, sort of an indigenous experience in a sense. Yes, for sure. Right, that two people can connect and that are differences are far decreased mm -hmm. than the things that we comport as truth. Yeah. Right? No boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, that's what music is about. It seems to me like you are on a trajectory of that anywhere you can. Well, that's what I do. I, like, uh, that's what I, I label myself as a genre mixer. Like I, I, uh, I play in like eight bands and they're not all rock bands like one is uh an r&b soul punk band one's a punk band one's a rockabilly band you know uh one's like kind of surf rockish you know uh like i'll do it all and i've been in all those rooms and i realized and learned and understood that music itself can be segregated like it can be uh, split up into their own rooms and their own attitudes and egos, you know, like you can, I can walk into it, like, I'm a sort of a chameleon, of a, uh, 
I guess, uh, like, I could just walk into a room and it's the jazz room. All right, hey, everyone, you know, no of them there. But then they don't know that I'm going to a death metal show right after. And I'll go in there. Hey, guys, how's it going? All right. Then I hop into a hip hop room. And hey, bros, what's going on? And I go into a country folk show, which I love. I go, I go, like, I've been in that scene, immersed in it recently a lot with the country and the most recent country folk that's going on in the scene. And there's some amazing stuff in there. And we got to know all, they're like, we're like family, right? And I noticed that everyone's just sort of in their rooms. So my job is to break down those barriers, make sure everyone coalesces merges with each other, understand each other's musical styles, guide people, educate people, and guide them into those rooms. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a small, it starts out small, but it ends up being huge, you know, and it's working and it's fantastic. And I love working with all the artists, with all the bands that I'm in, especially making Treaty 7 band. Like, you know, soon I'll see, uh, some indigenous people at a jazz show or I'll see a folk guy at a metal show, right? Just got to blend it all. Like we're all separated. Like we're, we all got to be one team here, you know, under one umbrella and just say, let's stick it to the man. The equality of art, yeah. the equity of art. Yeah. It's sort of like Smith and Wesson on the other side of things. It's mm -hmm. the great equalizer. Yeah. You know, art on the other side of the equation is also the great equalizer. Yeah. Music makes us all the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I have any judgment you at can all. Also, you can also create uh, new sounds, though. That, that's the thing, is that, um, like, it, I just gave you a Fly Trap CD, and I'm working on a new Fly Trap album right now, thanks to the government, believe it or not, the man. <laughs> the man. Here, Here let me hold this up. Funny, me, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to put that right there, and hopefully you can see that. Yeah, thanks to... That's uh, your last record, right? Yeah, yeah. it's the County Council of the Arts and Calgary Arts Development, um... They're financing my next album, and I, I'm so, you know, I'm filled with gratitude about it. And, and you know, I don't look at them as the man, I, even though it is the man, but, like, I'm really thankful. But what's coming out is a blend of sounds from all the rooms that I've been in, and it's kind of confusing. Like, I don't know what sound I, I am, so I just make my own, and hope to God people like it. It's like uh, a melange of... All the rooms that I've been in. Right. Think, yeah. And and maybe, you know, that that genre may be just called beautiful noise. Yeah. You know? you know? Like maybe it's just making music and genre. Yeah, like last night I was at a at a punk rock show, right? And then this morning I'm listening to like Al Jarreau. Mm. Right? Yeah. Like uh on. and then tonight I'm gonna go see my friends over at uh, the blues can. Right. You know, and they're going to be doing some country rock, like, like, it's just amazing how many rooms there are in Calgary with all these beautiful sounds. And every city has it. They right. just need to connect, you know, and maybe uh, have a government that would finance them to, like, flourish. Once again, you know, as I'm sitting here and you're talking, I just, you know, like something else comes to my mind. And that is that, you know, politics, religion, these things separate. Art mm -hmm. has no, it's never been determined that art has drawn apart people mm -hmm. as much as brought them together. Religion, politics, yes, yeah. separate, right? Yeah. This art that we're talking about really brings people together. Once again, it's the great equalizer, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the way, it's the commonality. Which yeah. is beyond the the political and beyond the religious. Yeah. It is the human yeah. experience itself. Yeah. I, I'm truly blessed to have, uh, you know, been guided to music, I feel, right? Like, uh, especially now after sort of kind of like, I wouldn't say surviving cancer, but um, that whole experience and like... Uh, it, it was like therapy. Music was like therapy for me. Like if I wasn't out uh, playing, um, I don't know what I'd do. I'd just lie in bed and rot <laughs> until until I die. Like I think what kept me alive was like music. Right. 
that going intangible out playing, going to shows right going to shows and playing a lot and creating music um collaborating with people writing lyrics like it's i believe it actually saved me that intangible esoteric you know undes <clears throat> nondescript thing that we don't have in schools anymore is yeah. that thing that and might have why actually are they saved this them? stuff in schools that's the question right. like why is there no uh music 10 20 30 well they have band right not in every school you know but to learn how to play the tri i was in band I, I learned how to play triangle and snare and right mm -hmm. like uh but not music uh theory right. they don't teach uh about sex pistols in school they don't teach about miles davis unless you go to university and choose to go into music uh I don't know if it, it's available, but I had to learn on my own and figure it out, right? Like about Frank Zappa, I had to discover the guy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and they should be really teaching this in schools. Well, absolutely. Like because from junior high, at least, you know? <clears throat> I mean, I remember singing Kumbaya, my lord, in elementary. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Clementine. My darling Clementine, you know, yeah. like, I, yeah. and I like that song. And, and musicals is what I had, like, I, you know, West Side Story, like, I, I had Jesus Christ Superstar, uh -huh. right? Um, like, this is what I had, like, for, to uh, escape whatever banality and fucking authority, like, it's just, I'm just, like, so bored well once again you know <laughs> once again you're doing it again because we we asked you know what's the problem is there a problem first is there a problem okay there's a problem what's the problem well okay so you define a problem right you see that 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 things are maybe unbalanced or you know the world's not quite yeah ordered uh and then you 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 start talking about yeah what is it about schools why are not the arts and philosophy and or the cooking. things that, like I, I wish I took a cooking school in junior high. Art, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I think they actually had the cooking. YouTube, everything, you know. Like, yeah, they had cooking in my uh, high school. Yeah, we didn't have cooking, but I didn't do it. You know, the thing is that I went to a Christian high school, mm -hmm. uh, Rosebud, Alberta, yeah. and so that's kind of where I found Jesus yeah. uh, back then. Uh, but that was an art school, mm -hmm. and so I ended up w uh, winning a. Uh, 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 scholarship to college yeah. in acting and uh, and then I was doing plays and everything else you know what I mean I mean you know, when I look back those were the valuable moments do I you know of course I can add two plus two yeah. but do I remember all the geometry shit that no yeah. but I do remember those experiences of being on stage I've been meditating for a long time I think they should be teaching um, like meditation in elementary of course yeah yeah yeah, you want to you want to uh, downgrade the pharmaceutical company? Yeah. Just get kids to meditate. Yeah. You know, by the time they hit junior high, there'd be no bullies. There'd be no bullies, bullies right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no that's right. People, because yeah. they would just be so kind and nice to each other. Right? right, and the experiment at that point would be: Can we get sick of love? And yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Man, I want to kick your ass. Hold on, let me breathe first. <laughs> right, <sighs> take ten deep breaths. Deep breaths. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I mean, what? once again, we ask the questions, but we already sort of have the answers intrinsically. Now, are those every answer? I have no answers, man. Well, no, no, no. But think about I it. I have are no the, answers. Well, you do have an answer. Yeah, do, you have, do you have all the answers? I have no answers. <laughs> uh, well, I think when you talk about education, when you talk about, you know, instead of indoctrinating the bully, maybe getting the bully and everybody else in the class mm -hmm. to understand their connection to one another. Yeah. That, to me, if it's not an answer... At least it's a hell of a fucking try. Yeah. You know? The way I work is to get rid of to get rid of bullies, be friends with them. And educate them and guide them. Like, dude, you don't have to be a bully. Right. You can be a super cool guy. Right. Or ask them, you know, when I see somebody on the C train or something, you know, and I have that connection where they're being a dick or they're, you know, yeah. I'll just go, dude, what happened to you? Yeah. You know, what's your trauma? Yeah. Where'd you get hurt? Yeah, exactly. Talk to me. Yeah. What's that? There's a joint. Let's smoke it. <laughs> hey, if you if you partake, you fucking too, do bro. it, right? You got a beer too. So and <laughs> we're not gonna debate that shit. <laughs>
No, brother, look, I'll tell you what. I mean, in so much as, as number one, you, uh, you were gracious enough to accept my offer here. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. Number two, once again, you don't fucking know people until you know them. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can assume anything I want about you. But once I get in this space with you, I start to realize, holy fuck, you're a human being with thoughts, with intelligence, with intellect. Really? With, well, sorry. Oh God. Yeah. I was just yeah. Kind of no, I guess I gave you bad here. news there. But, dude, that's that's the truth. And so I want to thank you for coming on today. Yeah, no, thank you for yeah. having me. You do you know. have anything else you want to do? You want to promote anything? Is there anything coming up that you'd like to? Um, you got a record you're working on, a new record? Five. I, well, um, I'm with a band uh, called Sergeant Comrade. I've been with them for almost seven years. And we have three albums coming out, two R&B solo ones and a reggae one that we did in a week. And uh, I, it's just shocking. I was like, I didn't even know I could play reggae. I know I got dreadlocks, but didn't mean I could play reggae. My dreads <laughs> came from like Jane's Addiction, the band Jane's Addiction uh -huh. back in the day. But uh, yeah, uh, and I got a Latin album, La Mosca. Uh, that's my Latin project. I used to play in a band back in the day for 20 years and did over 3,000 shows. They were called Los Morenos. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, like, and I don't even speak Spanish, you know? Right. But I'm learning Duolingo. Uh -huh. And uh, I mean, you don't have to be Chinese to make Chinese food, right? No. So um, we broke up and I went my own separate way in uh, La Mosca, uh, which is The Fly. It's right. my artist name is The Fly. Okay. And um, that Latin album is done. Huh. Yeah, and that's coming out. And Fly Trap, which is also my funk R&B soul, is coming out. That's the new Fly Trap. The Fly Trap okay. coming out, and uh, I'm really happy it was financed by the government. I right. was shocked. Here I was saying, "Fuck you, man! Fuck you!" Right. Pardon, you can edit that out. No, nope, uh, no, um, that shit stays. But then they gave me money, and I was like, "Oh, well, thanks, guys!" And I will kick some ass here and say thank you and maybe I should get along with the man, you know, in some weird way. Well, get along with the bully, right? Like we were talking about, but well, sometimes you, you know, I, I, I mean, it's not like, you know, it's sort of like the devil, right? They say yeah. that the devil tells you 99% the truth. Yeah. It's just the 1% that fucks you. Yeah. Right. And so I kind of look at governments that way. You know what I mean? We it's could, not like they don't do good things. If we could just get through the process of, you know, like I'm not a grant writer. So, like, but I'm, I've learned, how, like, through this whole process, I've learned how to grant right. right. Um, and I guess the government is what pushed me to learn about every detail of everything that you have to do to release an album. Because right. where before, I was just a snot-nosed punk rock kid that didn't know how to, you know, what's a business plan. Right. You know? If someone came up, where are you selling your album? I have no idea. At the record store down the street? Mm. Right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, but now it's like, I can go global now because now I got in my mindset every little detail of what the plan's going to be. Right? Absolutely. And I thank the government for that. Well, and you it's know. It's bizarre. I yeah. think they need to find a different way to just, you know, support their artists in their own city. Like, just, we shouldn't have to go through a difficult process to get the financing. I think we should just, they should just allot it. And like, we believe in you. Here's some money. Take it. That'll be. Do what you will. That'll you, be our. You're amazing. Yeah. Take it. That'll be our Let next our city discussion. Let thrive and shine. Let Calgary be the mark of Canada. <clears throat> yeah. You know, like. No, dude, I, I can't release... Like they put us through this shit. It's just like, holy crap. I can't release too much information regarding everything that you're saying, but this year I'm taking on the mantle of a few different things that mm -hmm. I probably won't say until I have more evidence to, to prove the words that come out of my mouth. But yeah. that's exactly where I'm going this year because I feel like the government can do a better job. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to say that they're not doing anything. They're doing they're something, not, but they can do a but... they can do a better job. They can do like you're saying a less convoluted. Faster. They can make it faster, right? A right? less convoluted yeah. process. Calgary could be literally a citadel in the music industry if they would just 
help us financially to thrive. You're preaching the conversion. Like here we are, like, geez, I gotta go work that full-time job I don't wanna do, and I can't, don't have time yeah. to write the lyrics, or, you know, I'm too, t like, yeah. I gotta go drinking now because I'm so stressed. You know, no, it's you're, just you're, like, you're, but you're, if they put us in a room and just finance us, it, it could thrive. Dude. It's so easy. That's exactly what this year is. You know, for, it doesn't cost that much. For this show. Like, I don't need a million dollars to do what I have to do. It's not about that. You know? You know, once again, you know, people talk about, um, you, you know, a meritocracy, uh, merit, uh, a system of meritocracy, mm -hmm. right? And so there could be, like, I have no problem with, with a meritocracy, uh, uh, meritocracy mm -hmm. as a standard for people getting more. The problem yeah. isn't should one guy get a little bit more than somebody else. The problem is at what point does it become rapacious to the system that yeah. someone make infinitely more than someone else and therefore perhaps put at risk the entire system of things yeah. and how things work so that they receive, you know, uh, grandiosity, whereas yeah. the other person then gets yeah. nothing. And so there is an equity to this. There is a fairness to this. And once again, I can't say it, but that's where I'm going this year. Yeah. But also, um, you know, there's an issue with venues as well, mm -hmm. right? Like venues um, in Calgary, like I feel for them, you know, like it must be expensive to run a live music venue yeah. in Calgary. It, and to the point where it's like, we can't pay you. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, Here's a couple hundred bucks, you know, and um, it's an issue I'd like to, you know, sit down with venues and discuss, like, why, like, what can we do, right? Like, I think, can I just interject here? Yeah. I think that if the, if the musicians themselves didn't necessarily to need to make their living from the club specifically, yeah. because the club suffers, right? If they can only pay a well, hundred bucks. growing up, they were able to pay, like, Nine people in a band. Of course yeah. they were. Yeah. Because music was a, a capitalist, a, a viable capitalistic, yeah. you know, now it's entity. Like, you know, now it's down to like trios or... Like, yeah, and one night a week, dude. Yeah. Like we used to have back sixes. Well, you know how you solve that? Join eight bands and then you're not playing one night Right, and make sure every... <laughs> yeah, yeah, each band plays one night a week. Um, no, the, the problem with the, the, the club... Structure is not necessarily a fault of the club itself. It can only pay what it can, and it can't do greater than that because yeah. if it does, it will hurt itself. Yeah. Therefore, both structures hurt the musician yeah. and the club yeah. because the club can't pay enough and the musician can't pay enough. What is it that the musician would not get his bulk of his subsistence or necessarily even desire it from the club itself? But, and this goes back to your other point, mm -hmm. the musician was uh, was taken care of subsistence, uh, subsistently from another entity, yeah. maybe the government. Yeah. So if, the, if, the, if there was something like a basic income guarantee, let's say, yeah. for people making up I say take a risk. I, for a venue, and this, I'm going to say this, mm -hmm. just take the risk, take your own money, put, put it in to the entertainment part of your venue because that's why you're opening up a bar. You want entertainment, we'll pay for it, no matter how much it is, how much it costs. Mm -hmm. Take the risk and pay for it, and the people will come. I've seen it. Yeah. I have been in venues, and I have promoted, I have hosted live music shows with live music bands. Like, I, for two years, a year and a half, with a bar called Vicious Circle. Okay. Another yeah. place... Uh, uh, without papers and and they did like they paid and uh, we would see people coming in and, and thriving so make money off your beer sales because people are there they're coming in and the word gets out and it's just like geez this is happening right right there's a happening so people come in droves mm -hmm. and I've seen it I've, I've made it happen because the owner of the venue decided to take a risk first they wanted me to pay they want to pay me. Hey, Marvin, go in that room over there in the corner of our bar and just with some friends, we'll give you a hundred bucks. And I said, here, how about this? Give me 500 and then I'll give you a show. Mm. And it did. And then the money started coming in. So sales from 500 would go to 7,000. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Take the risk. Right.
know? you know, here's the thing is that I won't argue that that train of thought because uh, I have no evidence for or against. You're saying, yeah. you know, one thing and you're saying that it works. And I think that's great. I think there are many ways to skin a cat. And it may not just be one way or another. It may be a combination of ways mm -hmm. in which to structure a system that ends up benefiting the way you're talking about yeah. and the way that I'm talking about. Because trust me, this has been on my mind and this is why this exists. Yeah, and I feel like this is why you're doing this because I feel like it's an issue that needs to be discussed and you're doing it. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. no one else is. Nobody else is. It's all in our minds walking around in bars going, damn it, what the fuck's next? Right. And, and not only that, I've had conversations with people that are willing to have the conversation, and then they either deflect and run away, or they go, or you're, neg you're negative. Or, right, or you're <laughs> negative, or, or, well, what's the answer? And I said, well, the answer comes when I sit and I talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps no answer comes at all. I'm not, uh, I'm not making this romantic, that we could actually have an answer. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that we can't. It means that if we don't dialogue and if we're not honest, it'll never come. Or it, so it will take someone else having that conversation to make it happen. Yeah. That's the only reason I do this. But I'm leaving proof that it works. Like, it works. Like, you can take a venue, just pay 500 bucks, and you'll get $7,000 in sales instead of $500 in sales. The other part of it is the show aspect that I think, you know, we're lacking in curatedness yeah. in our local scene because, you know, it pays shit. There's no incentive. Yeah. So, There's no so reason. So everything just falls apart because you're not Absolutely. putting gas in the vehicle. Right. You own a Maserati, right. put some gas in it so we can go all the way to its destination. Right. Right? Right. And yeah. yet, you know... Like if you're going to throw like 20 bucks of gas in there, then what's the point of the fucking car? Right. Get a cheaper car. So Come you can in. afford the gas. Go back to school. Become an engineer. <laughs> Dude, we could go on and on, and, but I'm not going to because this has been so good. We're going to have to go to the bar here and we're going to discuss even further. That's where here. the best conversation is. I was all hung over and now I'm just like amped. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you, you are. And I'm glad that, you know, I found it, a, a, a brother, you know, mm -hmm. in this city that is a, a willing to be as open as you have been and as honest as you have been. And I appreciate that. And I thank you for that. No, thank you for people like yourself. Yeah. Inquiring about stuff yeah. like this. I mean, you're a musician yourself, so yeah. it doesn't surprise me that you would question like, where do I fit into this? Where do I belong? Mm -hmm. And you have questions, yeah. right? And what, what's my voice? Not only yeah. is there a problem, but do I have not, maybe not a solution, okay. but what can I do in order to prov or get a solution? The solution may not come from me. It may not come at all. Yeah. But I'm willing to, to try. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. And Marvin. <laughs> I want to thank you, brother. Seriously. Like, this has been a great conversation. And I hope you all uh, at home got something out of it. You know that I want to interview almost... Every one of you motherfuckers in this city, because you all kick ass and you all have something to say. You are philosophical even when you don't think you are. And whether we have answers or not, the dialogue, like I just proved, is everything. Uh, thank you, Marvin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you all. We'll see you again next week uh, with a new one. Y'all treat each other great and be well till then. Yeah, that was like, fun. Like, seriously, man. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.